Coach Wooden, every fall school begins and coaches get together and begin to plan for the season. Uh, before practices actually begin in your pre-season or pre-practice sessions, uh, what are some of the critical things which you think coaches should consider? I'd have to answer that by first saying at the close of a season, I always tried to meet uh, with uh, my assistant and talk over the season and uh, put down things, make notes of things where I thought we could improve uh, for the coming year. And then sometime uh, before practice starts, and of course uh, I'm speaking now primarily of here at UCLA now, but the same thing would apply if we were back in high school or at someplace else, but you're going to have a definite practice time. And here our practice time is controlled by the NCAA. You start practice on October the 15th. So uh, shortly after the start of school, which is going to be, uh, say, near the middle or end of September, I start thinking about the practice uh, uh, situation, the team, uh, the personnel that we have, uh, and I'll sit down and uh, go over the entire preceding years uh, practice uh, schedules, which I keep a record of, a very careful record of the practice that we do every day, and I make notes alongside that that I can refer back to. And, for example, I could look back and tell you what we did in a practice on any day of the season 10 years ago very quickly by getting it out of the file. So I would review the previous year's practices and then uh, probably two previous years because I want to look back at every practice that I've had uh, in which any player that I now have on the team has uh, been a participant. And uh, then taking into consideration who we lost and what positions they played and where we feel that uh, the players that we're going to have this uh, particular coming year uh, under our supervision, where they should play and uh, what we think would be uh, uh, the possible combinations and try to uh, be open-minded, then uh, have a, a general idea of our practice plans for the season. General idea, because I... Uh, make the practice plan for any particular day the morning of that practice. But I have a general idea that I make out before the season starts of so probably what we want to cover this week and then next week and what we'll do uh, the week that we're playing certain games and, and the week we're playing other games. And then uh, we go uh, uh, from day to day and plan the particular practice, uh, considering, as I say, personnel, uh, schedule, uh, where games are played because you've got to uh, figure in your travel uh, situation and uh, um, whether we're going to make any changes and uh, the style, uh, knowing to begin with that I never believe in any uh, uh, major changes. I've uh, established a philosophy uh, many years ago and haven't changed too much from it. However, if you'd look at my practices, for example, of 25 years ago and uh, look at a practice today, you would wonder how I ever got anything done 25 years ago. But if you'd look at my practices uh, one year ago, you'd find they were not too much different from the, the next year. And if you go a year before that, it wasn't too much different from the year that followed it. But uh, small changes each year over a period of year become rather major. And these are the things that I want to take into consideration in the planning. Now, I'm a little different as far as players. I, n I never insisted or even encouraged my players to play a lot between seasons. I feel that there are many, many other things in which they could be and perhaps should be interested, and I don't want them to be ever get fed up with basketball. And I've been of the opinion that if they tried to think basketball the year round, they might be fed up with it before our season is ended. And that's the time where I want them to be at their very peak at the end of the season. I... Uh, for example, on practices, uh, where I have differed a little bit too, I've told my players that when they come to practice on any particular day, during that practice, I don't want them to think of anything else at all. I want basketball, 100% basketball. But when they leave practice, leave basketball on the floor. I don't want them thinking basketball between practices. Just on the floor during practice and say at a game, I want it to be 100% basketball. I never ask for 110% like some coaches because I don't think you can have even 100%. 100% is perfection, and of course that's merely a, uh, an ideal that uh, perfection is impossible to attain, but we'd like to get as close to it as possible. In the off-season, uh, are there any particular activities that, that you recommend for your ball players? 
I haven't recommended anything uh, particularly before practice opens except to have their feet in shape on the day practice opens. And I tell them how to get their feet in shape, and that will be on a hardwood floor. I don't believe in, for example, cross country. Now, many coaches have had their players uh, run cross country and have had uh, good success in it and believe in it. And if a coach believes in that, he certainly should do it. I did it one time, and perhaps I did it improperly because uh, we had shin splints almost immediately that year on our players, and it's the only year we've ever been bothered with shin splints, and it's the only year that I ever had them running outside cross country because I never did it after that. But I like for them to, uh, a couple of weeks before practice starts, say about the 1st of October, to get in on the hardwood floor every day and do some short sprints and some uh, defensive sliding and some quick jumping and some change of direction and change of pace running and not too much getting in and scrimmaging at that particular time. I, I uh, think they tend to overdo it when they get to scrimmaging. And at the least sign of their feet uh, uh, getting too warm, I like for them to stop. And I think if they increase what they're doing a little each day from, for say, two weeks prior to the first day of practice, I think their feet will be in good shape, and that's what I want. I don't tell them that I, I know that if their feet are in pretty good shape, that I know that their wind won't be in too bad a shape. <laughs> Many athletes, even in high school, uh, only participate in one sport. Uh, do you favor this? To some degree, I think it is an age of specialization. We're in an age of specialization and have been for uh, some time. But at the same time, I don't want them to get so wrapped up in one thing that they can't see anything else. I would uh, encourage uh, a player that's, say, in a, in a, um, a sport in the fall or the winter time. I'd in encourage him to be in something that's going to be outdoors come spring and summer. and. Uh, not just to think that he has to practice and work at the one sport uh, the year round. Now, there are some sports that aren't too compatible anymore because the length of seasons has uh, increased so much. And uh, also is the pressure on uh, certain sports, and it makes it uh, rather difficult. But I do feel it's right to tell a player that he can only participate in one particular sport. But at the same time, I think every youngster in school should realize that he's not in school for sports. He's in school for an education, and the uh, time involved in too many sports is going to have to be taken from somewhere, and one place uh, that should not lose any of the necessary time is their studies. Grooming and dress codes. Uh, do you believe in them, and should a squad help establish them, uh, and who should enforce them? I definitely feel that you should have a uh, dress and grooming code for the players. However, uh, uh, as times have changed, uh, so has the dress changed, and we must keep that in, uh, in mind. For example, there was a time when Levi's would not be acceptable at all, but now you see presidents of universities wearing Levi's. There was a time when uh, it was always necessary to have a shirt and tie. Now you see men in very high positions wearing sports shirts that don't require ties or turtlenecks and things of that sort. So you must change with the times and, and uh, understand that what was right 25 years ago as far as dress isn't necessarily right today. Uh, I was a little slow in changing about hair, and uh, I didn't permit my players to wear mustaches or goatees or extremely long sideburns, and I don't believe I would if I'd go back to coaching. But at the same time, I let them wear their sideburns a little longer than I did at one time, and I let them wear their hair a little longer. Uh, than I did at one time. I feel that uh, this, however, is something that should be decided by the coach. I don't think this is a situation that should be decided by the players themselves. I think the coach should decide what he feels is going to be in the best interest of the team, and then he should uh, uh, stick to that. I've had some very uh, spirited youngsters that have uh, sort of challenged me on that on occasions. I had one youngster, whose name I won't mention, that told me toward the last of his career that I'm not going to shave or get a haircut from now on as long as I live, and I believe thus far he's uh, kept his word. Uh, but uh, most of them uh, have ended up by saying, well, you're the boss. They might disagree. I try to tell them why and give them the reasons, and I can uh, very definitely give reasons, say, for our excessive long hair because it causes more perspiration, and this perspiration in turn is going to perhaps get in their eyes at times. It certainly is going to be running down their arms at times, and, and uh, they may be wiping it off their face at times, and they'll get it on their hands, and it causes them to make errors. 
it also is more difficult to keep well groomed and I think a neat clean appearance is necessary and it's uh, definitely more difficult to keep dry and usually they're going uh, out of practice into a cold night air somewhere and this makes them more susceptible to colds so I think there are a number of reasons why uh, excessively long hair should be uh, uh, prohibited. I cannot uh, give them the same reasons for sideburns or mustaches or goatees, and, but I'm honest about it and tell them that I can't, but I just feel that it is in the best interest of our team. I always did that, and I think that uh, for the most part, uh, my players always accepted it. Even though they might have disagreed, uh, they did accept it. Coach, what about behavior off campus? What if uh, one of your players were apprehended for smoking pot or for driving while under the influence of alcohol? How would you handle problems which weren't exactly school problems? Well, I wouldn't take the word of just somebody telling me that it happened. I would investigate the situation and find out, uh, to the best of my ability, whether or not the uh, accusation was true. And uh, oftentimes you hear so many things that when you find out, uh, get down to the bottom of it, they're not true at all. There are many who like to accuse uh, those who are in the public eye, and uh, athletes are in the public eye. For example, I don't believe there's nearly the amount of illegal recruiting going on as uh, most people do, because there, there's uh, people just like to accuse. And uh, it's easy for even coaches themselves feel that uh, if another coach gets a player in whom they were interested, they must have cheated, mm -hmm. because he surely would have come to me uh, unless somebody cheated to get him. So we mustn't believe everything we hear. We must get to the bottom of it. Now, let's say uh, uh, smoking pot, for example. Uh, that's illegal. And whether or not uh, uh, the player believes it should be or not, it is illegal. And you cannot back up a player uh, doing anything that is illegal. However, if let's say that you would have a player, as I did one time, to be honest about it, uh, that was picked up for... Uh, uh, having pot in the car in which he uh, was driving. and But the courts uh, uh, freed him completely. He got a clean bill of health. Now, what can a coach do about that? I don't believe you can do anything because you're leaving yourself open, uh, quite open. My point in a situation of that type was to uh, talk the youngster and try to show how uh, such a thing was only hurting him it could not help him in any way, and it is illegal, and whether he believed it should be illegal or not, it was illegal, and it's no different than uh, you, do, you might believe that there shouldn't be a 25-mile speed limit here. But if there is a 25-mile speed limit there, you better abide by it, or you're going to be in trouble. I don't believe that uh, uh, coaches or anyone in supervisory capacity uh, over youngsters should uh, in any way approve of the use of, of uh, pot, or uh, even uh, cigarettes, uh, uh, tobacco, or uh, alcoholic beverages, uh, even though parents might be using them and others might be using them, I don't think that you can approve of that and you should do everything within your power uh, to uh, prevent uh, their use. Well, one season, one of your more publicized players was reported in the press as being uh, seen on a nude beach. And since Mrs. Wooden wouldn't allow you to go to that beach to check up on him, how did you handle that situation? That's quite right. Nell wouldn't uh, approve of my going to any nude beach any more than I would approve of her going to a nude beach. However, as far as a player uh, being there, uh, if it's a legalized uh, place and there are uh, legal nude beaches, you know, I don't believe that uh, I'd be permitted to do anything about that regardless of how I might feel about it.